everyone. We hope you enjoyed the videos. So today this video will be different from the previous ones. So in this video, you will hear a very fruitful panel discussion on the responsible data science from its definition to its development in different domains. We had five speakers in this panel discussion to talk about their opinions on responsible data science. So if you want to hear what they think, please continue watching. This session, we wanted to discuss a little bit about responsibility by design. Um, I'm uh, Bishar Rovi and I'm, I'm going to be a moderator with Linda Reisvik. And uh, we're going to have our three previous speakers um, as panelists. Linda, I'm giving it up to you now. I think uh, it would be good if you introduced a little bit yourself and uh, we'll take it from there. Yeah, thank you, uh, Fizara. Um, so my name is uh, Linda Rieswijk. Uh, so I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Data Science. Uh, I'm not a data scientist by training. Uh, I have quite an interdisciplinary background. Uh, so I obtained my uh, master and bachelor degree in nutrition and health from the Wageningen University, so the agricultural university here in the Netherlands. Then I uh, uh, did a PhD here at Maastricht University on, in the domain of toxicogenomics. And um, there I actually worked together with Rachel. So uh, she's an old colleague of mine. <laughs> nice to see her here again. And uh, then I uh, gained uh, postdoc experience in bioinformatics, uh, environmental health sciences, uh, where, uh, uh, for which I went to the to, uh, Berkeley Uni uh, to University of California, Berkeley in the US. And uh, then I, uh, I joined here the Institute of Data Science where I am working on the responsible data science right now. So I'm sort of trying to combine all these different fields, uh, which is quite hard, but yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> and so currently I'm working on uh, different projects. Uh, one of them is the Brain uh, project, which is the Brightlands e-infrastructure for neural health data. Uh, another one is uh, the European Open Science Cloud Life Sciences Project. And another uh, program that I'm working on is a digital society research program where I mainly work on a responsible data science. And that's also one of the reasons why I'm here today. And, and besides those projects, I'm also interested in science communication. So I'm also a city coordinator of Pint of Science uh, Maastricht. Um, then we'll go to the next slide where I'll explain you a bit more about the digital society uh, research program. So it's a research program led by the VZNU, which is the Association of Dutch Universities. And this project is being led by 30 uh, different professors and all the 14 universities in the Netherlands are involved. And uh, this sort of project uh, was uh, created because uh, we, uh, there was a demand also from society which, to address many pressing questions raised by the emergence of the, uh, emergence of the, of the digital society. Um, so as I said, I'm working mainly on responsible data science, but there's also six other themes, which you can see on this slide, uh, where people are working on uh, different issues. Uh, so within the responsible data science uh, theme, we're focusing on the development of AI-driven, human-empowering uh, social technological solutions that incorporate social, legal, and ethical concerns. Um, AI systems that are fair, accurate, confidential, transparent, so they are... Uh, um, adhering to the fact principles. You might have heard of these uh, principles before when we talk about responsible data science. Uh, and we also believe that they should uh, be reliable and trustworthy. And we should also work on the FAIR aspect. So you might have heard of this acronym before as well. So that stands for uh, making your data and your digital resources findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, so, so as to increase the visibility and the impact of our research. Um, let me see. So uh, I would like to uh, welcome our uh, speakers again that we've already heard before. So we have uh, Dr. Anne Fleur van Veenstra here uh, from TNO. We have Rachel, Dr. Rachel Cavill from uh, the uh, Department of Data Science and Knowledge Engineering. And we also have uh, Professor Dr. Anna Wilbeek, uh, also from uh, DKE. So welcome everyone. <laughs> Um, so for the sake of our discussion, uh, we'll, we'll sort of stick with this definition of what we see as responsibility. So we believe that responsible data science by design emerges when people and institutions articulate and implement a responsibility agenda. 
So people and organizations should operate according to technical best practices, social norms and values, legal obligations and ethical actions when they uh, pursue and disseminate data. And they should also undertake um, ongoing ethical reflection, plan organizational commitments, develop responsive technology and instill evaluative uh, mechanisms. So in other words, responsible data science is an attribute of technical systems but it's also executed by humans, which is crucial uh, to keep in mind. So we should also have a human in the loop. Um, and we should sort of think about this process already from the start. So not only at the end, once the algorithm has already been uh, sort of uh, developed. Um, so we've already heard these uh, talks before about our speakers, uh, about responsible data science, uh, looked at from different sites and different angles and different domains. But how can we now sort of incorporate these different topics? And uh, why do we actually need responsibility? Are there any examples? I think we've already heard some examples before, but this is a very, uh, um, very good, well, I wouldn't say good, but it's a correct example that explains why we need responsible uh, data science. So before uh, World War II, uh, the government collected a lot of data about its population. Uh, so prior to the Holocaust, However, they didn't think of the fact that this data could also be misused. So it was misused quite dramatically by the Nazis. And that's also the reason why uh, the percentage of death uh, in the Netherlands, Dutch Jews, uh, the death rate of, the, of Dutch Jews is a lot higher than other countries when we, for example, compare it with Belgium and France. So this once again reminds us of why we actually need responsible data science because we need to avoid these things from happening uh, from the start. Um, so first of all we have a question for our panel members to start the interaction. So what is the state of responsibility in your domain and uh, how is, does it work in your organization? Um, so I think uh, maybe on Fleur can start and then Anna and then Rachel. Thanks a lot, Linda. Um, well, that's uh, uh, I, I was still pondering on this gruesome example you were given, uh, uh, and it's it's something to bear in mind. And um, when we talk, we, we hear a lot of data scientists asking, and also others. I mean, if, if I would uh, I would if I would take as my domain the public sector, there's a real data hunger. I would say there's a, a real um, um, a quest for getting more and better data to be able to. To better analysis, but it's, I mean, the, the data limitation principle is, is there for some reason. Um, <coughs> so coming back to the question, to the question you're asking on the state of responsibility in the public sector domain, I would, I wouldn't rate it as very high. <coughs> and I particularly liked also uh, the, the previous presentation, uh, uh, Anna, thank you very much for, uh, with, with a nice slide with a, uh, different balls highlighting saying that explainability and transparency they're not the same and I think the same goes for responsibility. Responsibility has a lot of these uh, balls that sometimes under interact and um, but I would argue that overall in the public sector <clears throat> there is focus on one or two aspects so there's a lot of focus for instance on complying to the GDPR and I think there's a lot of focus on bias in data sets but other elements of responsibility are much more overlooked. Okay, thank you, uh, Anna Fleur. Um, Anna, can you elaborate on that? Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Linda. If we look at uh, fuzz systems uh, domain, then uh, we can see that um, interpretability or uh, transparency was um, on the agenda for a long time. Actually, it is one of the biggest advantages of uh, fuzzy inference systems, fuzzy modeling, that the models are more interpretable, more transparent than the norm traditional black box models. So I think uh, because of this, uh, let's say making the results, making the models more understandable, more open to the user, uh, uh, was uh, really important. Perhaps it was not always on the topic of responsibility, what you can do with the data, but uh, perhaps to avoid um, 
strange uh, correlation patterns uh, because uh, we all know that uh, many of the machine learning models uh, they operate on the correlations and you can always find some strange artifacts in the data. Uh, so if you know which patterns are used to build uh, the models, uh, then uh, if you can understand those patterns, interpret th those patterns, then you can uh, avoid uh, those strange uh, behaviors, those strange artifacts being present. And uh, I think this is ve it's very good that this discussion on the responsibility of AI systems is uh, taking place uh, right now because there are still many open uh, topics and challenges that we have to answer. Exactly. Uh, so uh, maybe Rachel, you can uh, uh, put some light onto the biomedical field. Uh, and from that perspective, how do you think uh, the state of the art is currently uh, with regards to responsibility? Yeah, I, I have to agree with the previous speakers that I think the responsibility of my domain is also not great. Um, there are a lot of challenges here and the pressures on particularly researchers, the pressure is still to publish and to find interesting results to publish. So the, that doesn't lead to responsibility because you try uh, 10 things and you publish the one that works and you don't talk about the nine that didn't work or investigate why they didn't work, if, in general. Um, you do see occasional papers where people do look into these things, and I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to be found in why things don't work. And then there's also the, the other aspects, the fact, the uh, fair aspects of sharing our data of, uh, and how do we encourage responsible reuse of data how do we encourage people to be able to uh, do it? And I think it's about incentives in the field. And a lot of the time we've been doing it with sort of the stick that in order to publish in your journal, you have to make your data public, but then people do the bare minimum. They tick the box, they do enough, but that doesn't give us responsibility. The bare minimum never will. And we need to try to work out how we can incentivize this. Yes, very well. And and what do you think uh, that an organization like the UN, for example, or TNO should do to sort of support these uh, actions from uh, happening? Uh, uh, maybe on Fleur, you can say something for TNO. Uh, what what is happening from the organization side? Uh, they give people training, for example, or could you elaborate? Yeah, well, this is actually a very topical question. I think we're in the process of implementing. So last year, um, with all the other universities, TNO um, assigned the uh, uh, NGWI, the National Nationale Gedragscode, Wetenschappelijke, so the national, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to translate quick. So it's about scientific integrity. Um, <clears throat> and it basically says open when possible, closed when necessary. Um, and I think, um, uh, so TNO has a huge challenge there because we are the main research institute for the on defense topic. So we do a lot of top secret stuff. I'm not really involved in that, but that challenges the implementation of this policy. So this is actually a major theme in our organization. And I think, so next to the, the challenge that Rachel just mentioned on the, 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 uh, the, the drive to publish rather than, so, so also TNO, you know, you, as a researcher, you publish your report and then now we're obliged to um, provide as many open data as possible where, where we can. But it's basically the report is finished, the project is done, probably the, the money, the budget left in the project is also done. And then you need to think about how to uh, open up your other results. And this is a real challenge. And we're actually in the middle of coming up with incentives to do so. So it is a main theme, but um, I think it's also a very human uh, uh, aspect to it, like how, but we need to incorporate, do we find this really important? Thank you. And it's very good to hear that an organization such as TNO is already trying to work on these uh, issues. So thank you for that. Uh, Anna and Rachel, uh, maybe one of you can uh, have a, a, a view about what a university should do. And Anna, you're coming, for, well, Rachel as well, she's also coming from other universities. Do you see a difference maybe? Um, so I've, I've noticed, Anna, that you also worked in the US. Uh, do you see a difference there with uh, 
when people had uh, talk about responsibility. Uh. Uh, so in the uh, in US, I was working with uh, personal data. I was working on a project related to elder care. So uh, before actually I got access to the data, I had to get the certificates of um, reliable and responsible use of data. And uh, also uh, uh, the ethical board that was supervising the project had to approve, uh, let's say, my project plan, my uh, addition that uh, uh, the, before I could even uh, see the data. Uh, and was in the U.S. or was that here in the Netherlands? It was. Uh, it was. Uh, it was in the. In, it was in the U.S. Okay. So there and this uh, because the data were coming from sensors monitoring the behavior activity of people, and um, I think uh, we all knew that um, even though we know that subject uh, 3005 is John, uh, and we talked with John uh, many times because we were visiting this elder place facility, but, uh, uh, and sometimes uh, name John was used instead of uh, uh, the number because to make the person, to make the research more personal, but those things, they never uh, leaked uh, actually outside. So um, there is this uh, big uh, fire, fire war that um, well, once you are accepted, uh, you can make your research a bit more personal, but outside it is very much anonymized. In uh, Europe, I think this is uh, very much um, depends on the researcher, but um, I know that more and more universities, they are uh, setting and organizing the ethical boards to get them, let's say, to discuss about uh, use of, uh, of personal uh, data and the projects that are using such data. Okay, that's good to hear. Okay, I think we should go to the next question because uh, we have some uh, other mm -hmm. questions uh, coming up. I think there is some agreement that this is a difficult topic and we are still at early stages. It's very relevant and there is a lot of discussion around it. And uh, we see a lot of cases also in the, in the, in the public uh, view about uh, the impact or the, the um, Usually, it's about negative impacts of certain uh, data science algorithms, and we see that uh, on one side, the public, for example, um, felt some protected in a way, but on the other side, uh, there are these decision makers who need to set some policies, maybe. And uh, we wanted to uh, pull a little bit the uh, public here uh, about what they think should should uh, rules and regulations or should should a responsibility be defined from the uh, regulation perspective so high uh, uh, with a um, top down approach or we follow a bottom up approach where the people say we we don't want these cases of uh, bias, for example, to uh, affect us so much. Uh, this is how we, what we need. So this sort of starting from the public towards the more uh, rules and regulation. Uh, I think we have a pool in Slido. Sure if it's just, ah, there it is, yes. Can you see it? So let, let, let's see, let's see what, what, what sort of, uh, what is your first thought about that? Or I'm not sure. Yet. <laughs> easy, an easy question because maybe it's not uh, either cannot, but uh, yeah. For now, I see mostly top down, is, but it's almost 50 50, so we are split there. Yeah, it looks like we are split. So let, let's give the floor to to our to our speakers and let's ask a little bit. Uh, uh, maybe Anna, we start from Anna and then we move to Rachel and and then to Anfleur. What do you think? 
I don't like over regular uh, regularization. I think uh, we should uh, trust uh, the people. So that's why I'm, um, I'm not in uh, for a favor for a top down uh, solution. Perhaps um, some things can uh, regulate itself, and if we can allow over regularization, this is always better. Yeah, I, I think we're actually missing a group of people in that uh, dichotomy. The decision makers and the general public uh, are both groups, uh, as Anna Fleur identified in her talk, that don't have expert knowledge in this field. And I think we also need the experts to put in some input and to share that with both of those groups. And so almost a kind of meet in the middle, but with an expert guided meet in the middle. I'm not saying that the experts need to make the decisions because obviously, um, while we understand the methods, we have our own biases and we don't see things the same way as either the decision makers or, nor the general public. But I think ignoring the experts is also flawed. That um, we, we can see things in a different way and can maybe explain things better and, and can help to for, form whatever regulation or whatever patterns need to be there. Maybe let me follow up a little bit here. Is there something that we can give to the to both groups? Now we said they are not experts. So uh, is there something uh, maybe for Anflor that we can give to both so that they can uh, sort of decide whether um, an algorithm or a program or something that they're using is responsible or not by design? Yeah, thanks, Fizara. This is a really interesting thought. Actually, I, I agree with Rachel. That is, uh, that I mean, it was is for and for a poll, a dichotomy is very nice. But I would say it's um, it's not an either or question. It's an we, we need both. And uh, first of all, I think the systemic and um, uh, impacts of these use of the use of AI or algorithm may be way too large to not regulate it at all. And it's actually it is already quite regulated, right? We have human rights. I think the, the Siri case, which is, of course, a very renowned example of a, of a system that was uh, banned by courts, it was based on human rights law, which is applicable to anything we do. So it's not, so it is already regulated. Um, and, and Pizarra, I think your thought is, um, so the way I look at it is that we, we currently have a few building blocks in place, but not all yet. So one thing that is firmly um, uh, in place are all what are perhaps even too many of these uh, frameworks or, of principles um, that can be uh, used to, to, uh, to use as guidance for developing responsible AI. Although I am afraid that those that are actually working in the field um, can't see um, the wood for its trees. There are too many, there's just there are too, too many of them and the principles are not uh, clear cut enough. So in that sense, um, I'm not sure whether it's always possible to develop to pre-develop algorithms, but I do think we need much more insight. And I really liked um, uh, um, uh, the, sort of the, the steps that, that Anna went through in her talk um, to sort of understand what type of algorithm, what type of openness can be required in a specific situation. And I think that would be super useful. For example, for those in municipalities that really want to develop data science responsibly, but simply don't know how to because they're just giving these high level. But at the same time, we see that the systemic risks, such as, uh, for instance, encountered by the, in the Tuslag Affair, by the Dutch tax office, um, um, they also require perhaps not regulation, but at least policy to ensure that we um, um, take a different approach to deploying these technologies. My next point is uh, the child welfare scandal that you sort of mentioned already, where they also um, used an algorithm to determine uh, fraudulent parents, um, mostly on, um, it turned out, uh, on uh, their second nationality. So they had an immigrant background. Um, 
and this sort of led to this whole scandal where the government sort of had to step down because they were not uh, regarded as tr trustworthy anymore. Um, so in the end, uh, sort of the decision makers had to take responsibility. Uh, but uh, I think Anfleur already indicated that uh, this is not really the way to go. <laughs> so there should be some steps in between uh, where we sort of have human in the loops um, that sort of check whether these algorithms are actually um, doing what we want them to do and they're not doing stuff uh, that we don't want, that we don't have the intention to discriminate people, I would assume. So uh, maybe it's like some checkpoints in between. Um, um, so, so uh, yeah, let me go back. So what, what did you think of this uh, example? Uh, was, it, uh, was it good that the government sort of took responsibility or do you think um, uh, it should have gone in another way? <laughs> Maybe um, on Fleur you can sort of start. I think you have some expertise in this sort of public sector uh, algorithms. Uh, um, so you, I, yeah, I think we heard already a lot from you. Uh, but yeah, it would be very interesting since this is your sort of topic, right? So, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try to save some for the other. Well, I think <laughs> to distinguish two things in this case. I think the question of the government stepping down was a clear result or had nothing to do with technology. Um, the, it was sort of predetermined that they wanted uh, to discriminate um, and then uh, enter algorithm, enter data, and they made it happen. But so I think that it, that that had even nothing to do with technology. But it does show that when you have a certain intent and then you use technology, it can be sort of amplified this intent. Um, and that's why I think you need a lot of checks and balances. And right now we, we are looking a lot at algorithm and and openness or or publication of algorithm. But I think we should focus much more on the design process. Um, or at the, the checks and balances surrounding it. Who is keeping oversight? Um, who, is, who is signing off on these systems? Are we just, um, I mean, in the public sector, it's all done by private organizations, right? There's very little knowledge in this sector. So do we give them the right incentives in building technology? So I think it's a lot of these checks and balances that need to be in place. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think like, Part of that is also like improving training of uh, people that are working in public policy, that they are also aware of these things, right? So uh, um, I think the next question, which is more focused on uh, building um, a responsible algorithm and maybe uh, Rachel and Anna can uh, sh shed their light on uh, what they think is, uh, is needed to do this. So now we talked about irresponsible behavior, but what sort of would be the right steps? I think Anna already gave a really interesting talk about that, but uh, how can we now uh, put this into practice? Uh, so, so maybe, yeah. Rachel. Um, so from my perspective, I think the first thing we need to bear in mind is that our data is biased and we need to build into the process thinking about what biases are in our data. Um, and um, and try to understand those because um, I think sometimes, not always, uh, the irresponsible algorithm comes not from a deliberate desire to discriminate against a group of people, but from just not thinking about the impact of the data that you have. Um, and as an example of uh, training an algorithm to predict uh, the jail sentence length in the US. And they, they were aware that this may have some bias towards uh, black uh, people. So they decided to um, remove race as a feature and train it on the other features. But what they didn't check was which of the other features were correlated with race. And of course, in some areas in America, uh, black people tend to live in certain postcodes. So instead of learning that black people need longer prison sentences, it learned that people in those postcodes needed longer prison sentences. And these were inherent biases in the data from the existing situation. It's just really highlighting what is currently happening because it was trained on the current data. So 
we need to build in thinking about the biases and we need to build in thinking uh, steps to actually step back and think about how we evaluate our, our algorithms at the end. Is it just on accuracy or do we also build in checks and balances to look for different biases? How do we do that? How do we and how do we make that part of the standard process? Because it takes time, it takes energy, it takes money. Just quick follow up uh, for Anna. If we remove bias, then are we automatically responsible? Uh, bias and responsibility is uh, something uh, something different. But I think we should um, stress here two things. Uh, uh, that uh, first, there is a difference between a responsible system and responsible use of the system. So even if you have a good responsible system, you can uh, go wrong, uh, go wrong, and go around it. So a good system will make it more difficult, but it, it will not prevent uh, your misbehavior. So. Um, there are two, two things, and uh, let's say if we are uh, focusing on responsible system, we should also accept that we will never make it 100% uh, responsible or uh, bias free because then uh, the cost is too high or the system will be unusable. So we have to make some uh, compromises here. And what is missing should be mended with uh, responsible use so those are uh, those two sides are coming hand in hand and we cannot uh, uh, move forward without uh, uh, any of them so uh, we should uh, look at what is the cost uh, let's say of prevention versus cost of uh, uh, let's say financial cost of making it or usability or uh, security so uh, and sometimes we don't have uh, the data that we can just make unbiased system. But if we know that those are the biases, then uh, perhaps we can uh, allow uh, the human to make the decisions that counteract, uh, that take into consideration this bias so that uh, the, it can be corrected for the bias that is in the data. So I think we are almost out of time. So uh, uh, maybe Linda, we have a last question for the public. Yeah, so we had another poll question uh, for you guys. So with great power comes great responsibility as Voltaire already uh, quoted <laughs> or mentioned. Um, so we have a question for you guys. Who do you think is responsible here? Okay, so I think uh, we mainly see that everyone in the system is responsible. The community, uh, the programmer still. <laughs> People paying legal bills. <laughs> Maybe if we want to conclude, uh, thank you very much to uh, everyone uh, joined, that joined us here in this panel. <laughs> If you like this video, please subscribe our channel. Um, we will deliver more interesting video for you.